Well, y'all are in for a, something new here, since I've never done this before. I was uh, talking to some friends of mine that are preachers. They said, you'll either be done in 15 minutes and wonder what you said, or you'll be there way too long. So hopefully we'll be in the middle. I'm watching the clock. Um, this is something I've actually been preparing for for a long time. Um, probably not as long as I should have been, but you know, it's never too late to get started. So what I'm going to bring to you today is out of Second Peter, and it's verse 1 through 5. Second Peter is written by the Apostle Peter, and it was written in basically three parts. One is the assurity of salvation. And I, was, I remember talking to somebody here in this church, and, and they, they question their salvation sometimes uh, for whatever reason. And I think all of us as Christians sometimes wonder you know, where we're at with our salvation. And, and you hear so many different things, and the world's always pulling you one way or the other. But the first part of Second Peter is written to give us that assurance of our salvation so that we can grow in Christ, so that we know that we're okay where we are. So as we, as we look at it, I'm going to read the first, actually the opening to the, to the book, and it's, I, Simon Peter, a servant of the apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior Jesus Christ. May the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So his opening, this book was written to all, Jews and Gentiles alike, this is, but it's written specifically to those that are already believers. As opposed to some of Paul's books and stuff where he was, he was reaching out to those that were still not quite firm in their faith, Peter is specifically reaching out to us that are believers. And it's, it's to confirm your calling and your election in Christ is what he's trying to help people understand. So in, in verse 3 it states, His divine power has granted to all of us things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So when you think about what Peter is talking to us about, you've got to know who Peter is. Peter's one of the original called he was fishing, standing in his boat. He's, he's known throughout the Bible to make kind of, as one word was, impetuous decisions, rather impromptu. So you can imagine he's fishing, and any of us that are working, Chris is a plumber, my son's a construction worker, uh, you know, if somebody just walked up and said, hey, I'm, I'm Christ, follow me. You've you got a lot of tools, you've got a lot of money, you've got, a, you've got an investment in your time, and, and Peter and his brother, at that time he was Simon, just walked off and followed him. So to, to be called by Christ, obviously there's a, a firm calling there. This is the same man that uh, as he stepped out of a boat, he made a, a, what I think is a rather rash decision to just step out of a boat and walk on water. That takes some, some serious fortitude and, and, and faith. And we know as soon as he started to, to you know, question his faith a little bit, he, he then had to be saved again by his Savior. But the point is, is that this is the same man that, that said he would never deny Christ, and yet we know that he denied Christ three times. This is a man that walked with Christ. That for the three years Christ was on this earth preaching to people and bringing the good news, Peter was with him the whole time. So when Peter's writing these two epistles, it does us well to listen to what he has to say. Peter wrote this book as a warning also against false teachers and false doctrines. He starts the book showing us how we must put forth an effort to know God more and to add to our faith. As we look at the headlines of today, you can see many false doctrines, whether it's you know, within the church. Um, there's, when you think of who's on TV preaching, there's a couple people that come to mind that uh, probably aren't preaching exactly the right doctrine. And if you're not firm in your faith, it's easy to fall down those paths, to follow that doctrine of you know, believe in God and you get more money, or you, know, you can be touched and healed as you walk on stage, or if you drink the right water. And those, those are actual false doctrines. And this was even happening in Peter's time. You know, there, was already, there was already arguments within the church as to what should be being done. Um, another one is legalism. And, and 
when you look at the history of the church and churches in particular, legalism has probably split more churches than anything in Christianity because there's, you know, people get tied up in not knowing that the faith is through the grace of Christ and following rules isn't, and works isn't how you get there. But that's not to say we don't have to put some work into our faith. And we have to put that work into learning to know God and, and learning more about God. Because if you want to emulate somebody, if you want to be like somebody, you have to know what they're like. So when we look at kids that, you know, get into sports or get into following something like that, you know, if they emulate a sports character, who do they want to be like? Um, we, we were into baseball, my family was growing up, and, and I remember being a Minnesota Twins fan, Kirby Puckett played for the Twins, and he had a certain stance and a certain way of, of hitting the ball. And, and you see a lot of little kids in Minnesota that would emulate Kirby Puckett would do that same stance. I'm not going to try to imitate it. But it was something that they were emulating him, and they had, the only way they could emulate him was by studying him, by watching him, by knowing more about him. And as a Christian, you know, I like to count how many times the pastor says it, but you've got to stay in your Bible. You, gotta, you have to stay in God's word and, and be surrounded by God's word so that you can get to know him more. You stay with God by praying to God, to, by conversing with him, sometimes sitting silently with him and just listening and, and hearing what he has to say. And this is what Peter goes on and on about. There is those out there that think, you know, they say once saved, everything's good, you're okay. The world wants us to be like, well, you know, you're Christians, you can still do things. You can still have fun. But once you're saved and, and you continue to build yourself, there are certain things that you might have been fun, but now you, you want to do them less because you know God more, you know what you should be doing. You're not, doing, you're not getting into heaven quicker or further into heaven because you're doing good things. It's just because you feel like you want to honor God, you will want to do those things less. There are still people in certain faiths and, and within the world that will tell you it's okay to you know, go out and have fun Friday or Saturday as long as you show up church on Sunday. And I feel bad for those people because they, I think as you get further and further into the knowledge of God, the more you understand, the more you see how wonderful everything is. Does it mean everything's going to be happy in your life? No. But the more we know about God, the more we're prepared for those hard times that come. I have a sister that lost um, a daughter to a car wreck. One year before that car wreck, her daughter begged her to come back to church. My sister went, and she says to this day, it's been 18 years, her saving grace was that she got back to church and got to know God again. That's what saved her from that whole horrible event. And so she doesn't know where she'd be if she hadn't got back to God and back to, to knowing God. But she thanks him now for, for the daughter that died, for her impetus to pull her back to church. We have people that get upset about which translation of the Bible you use. They get upset about what day you meet on. And again, that's that, that leaning towards legalism. And we just want to stay with what's in this book and, and stay focused on what he has to say and not what the world says. What I say up here, what, what the pastor says on Sunday, as long as we're following what God's being said, it's not my interpretation, it's what God's word says. But sometimes we get distracted because there's people up here in these positions that are saying things salted with the truth but peppered with lies. And because followers don't know the word, they can get distracted or be, get taken down a bad path. Many of us think of a couple of big names. Harold Brown wrote a book called Heresies. And in his book, he notes that the uh, Christian faith is, and I'm going to quote him, is the only major religion, many of whose paid full-time priests, prelates, and professors spend much time and energy trying to show that it is false and should be totally changed or perhaps even abandoned. He goes on to say that he thinks the Bible and historic Christianity is so obnoxious to the prince of darkness that he makes a point of tempting the professors and priests of Christianity to undermine their own doctrines. This was happening in the, in the time shortly after Christ died. You know, we know Peter wrote this book probably in the last four years of his life as he was sitting in prison in Rome, and he died, I believe, right around 60, 64 AD, so, you know, less than 70 years after Christ is gone. 
they're already trying to split the church. That's how important it was to Satan to try to stop this thing. Fortunately, he has not gotten very far. Um, I just want you to know I'm struggling because my printer is really bad. So <laughs> Tam and I have been struggling with a bad printer for a while, so it's a little dim. Um, in 2 Peter 1, it says, We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. And that's Peter talking about the apostles that walked with Christ. You know, if, if you're going to listen to anybody, listen to these people that heard it from the word of Christ himself. They know what they're talking about. Peter is telling us that if we listen to him and do as he says, we will be assured of our salvation, which will then help us avoid the false teachers and persecution to come. Again, he's not saying that by doing this, we're going to be further into heaven or more gold or whatever. He's saying that we will then feel more assured and we can then be prepared for what's coming at us, whether it's end times or temptation. He's already seen the false teaching in his day, and he knows that it's only going to get more prolific until the return of Christ. Christ asked this man, he said, you're going to be the corner of my church. So, you know, in, in Christianity, he's considered to be the first pope. So again, it bears well to listen to him. If we're to work out our salvation so that we can resist what's coming, there are some things we need to do. This way, in the days of persecution, in the days of false teachers, and the pull of the world, we, as believers, can stand firm because we know that because of our knowledge of God and the things that have been added to it, these things will help us know the surety of our salvation. Second Peter 1 and 2, 1, 2 says, Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This, the first five chapters, of the, or the first five verses of this, constantly talk about knowledge of God. The more we know God, the more grounds and reasons we shall have for enjoying the grace and peace. And the more we know God of Jesus and our Lord, the more we will have the enjoyment of those grace and peace and it will be multiplied. In our work, in our daily life, there's going to be times where people are going to question why you're a Christian. They might question, you know, what, what is the basis of your faith? And this all comes down to knowing God. If, if somebody questions you, you know, the the people that have challenged me the most on the knowledge of the Bible are mostly atheists. They, I have one friend, I'll bet he knows almost everything. He's probably read the Bible several times because he's working so hard to say it's not true. You know, my prayer for him, his name is James, my prayer for him is that he will, this word will enter his heart and he'll be changed. But until then, he's a very intelligent individual and I, and I worry about the people he may run up against that aren't as strong or not as knowledgeable. So you have to constantly stay knowledgeable in it. Second Peter 1.3 says, According to his divine power hath given unto all of these things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. There again is that word knowledge. It's through knowing God that we realize that this that his divine power hath given unto these things that pertain to us life and goodness. For these things are in him, and as we know him, trust him, love him, and become like him, we also will then possess these things. That's a quote from Spurgeon. Let that sink in a little bit. The more we know these things, the more we're going to be like that. So when, when people see us as we know him and we know love and we know grace and we know forgiveness, what are people going to see in us? Love, grace, and forgiveness. If, if that is not something to emulate, I don't know what else is. I constantly say in my prayers, I want to be the light on the hill for those around me. But if I'm not treating my wife well or I'm not doing my, my due diligence at my work, if I'm going out on the town, am I that light on the hill? Or am I a beacon of hypocrisy? I don't want to be a beacon of hypocrisy. I want to be welcomed as a good and faithful servant. Second Peter 1 4 reads, Where, whereby we are given unto this exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world 
through lust. What is God's great reason for giving us exceeding great and precious promises? It is that we may become morally and spiritually like him. Just and true, holy and righteous, even as God himself is. Though we fall short of this high example, we find that set before us is our gracious God. Nevertheless, we must press forward towards that goal to be strengthened by God. We must be strengthened by God who he himself, who having begun to make us like himself, never ceased that blessed work until it is fully accomplished. So until Jesus comes back, we are to continue, per the word of God, we're to continue trying to be more like God. Are we ever going to make perfection? No. When, when Christ returns and we get called by a trumpet, then we'll be in those perfect place and that perfect body. But until then, we're to continue. And as we struggle, I think, you know, I'd have to say these times we're in right now are, are a sign of struggle. And, and I think there's, a, there's quite a few times where we can all look at the news. I'm to the point I don't even want to watch the news anymore because it's depressing. But boy, it sure gives you a lot to pray about. Our knees should be worn out. Second Peter 1.5 says, And besides this, giving all diligence... That's not, a, that's not a common way we think of diligence. We don't think of diligence as action. But in the Bible, what he's speaking to is, is we need to work on this. We need to know God. We need to be here. We cannot sit idly by waiting for God to do more work in us. Some say, trust God and let him work. He has done his work. He did his work in us by calling us and by giving us the grace of Christ's atonement of our sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do not let Christ's death on the cross be for naught. That, that is such an amazing thing to me to know that there are people that have died and have not worried about it. I, I, I'm, it saddens me. Our goal every day should be to look for a way we can infect somebody with that seed of, of wanting to know Christ. And the easiest way for that is our actions. We must continue to know more about God and we must do this by staying in his word, going to church, communing with brothers and sisters in Christ, and this also means things like Sunday school, which I know the colonel would like to hear. It means things like coming here on Wednesday night. If you're not centered around those that you know are Christians, if you're more pulled towards those that aren't Christians, it's easier to be swayed. Um, I, Tam and I live in a room in a house that's surrounded by everything on the walls is Christ based our music we listen to is Christian based there is a Bible within arm's reach in just about every room I think Ezra has three or four in his room um, our former pastor always had a Bible within hand's reach he, he told me that that was his goal in life, no matter, in, unless he was on the golf course. <laughs> he had a Bible within arm's reach. I have a brother-in-law. At my father's funeral, I was talking to my brother-in-law from Oregon, and he reads the Bible once through every year and has done that for 40 years. He reads a different version every year. I don't know about all y'all, but there's some stuff in the Old Testament that's hard to read through, but it's there for a reason. I'm not saying you have to read through the Bible every year, but at least read the Bible. Our, our studies that we do on Wednesday night are specific to, like right now we're doing James. This is all built to help you know God and to help you know the richness and, gr and wonderfulness of his grace. We supplement our faith with virtue and with virtue we supplement it with knowledge and with knowledge we su supplement it with self-control 
self-control and steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly love. When you have added these things, it is your assurance that you have salvation. That is not my words. That's from Peter. The only other book that really speaks to this as, as bluntly as Peter and the false prophets and false teachers is the book of Judas. But if you go back through, there are, there are a number of ways to know your salvation. And as you look through Ephesians and the, and the letters of Paul, when you think about what's going on in your life and how you've reacted to something, that is truly where you know your salvation is sound. As I look around, I know people in here have struggled with health issues, they've struggled with loss of life of their family and friends, and I've seen some stand so strongly in the faith of God. It's amazing. To walk with these people is humbling. I hope that I could be that strong. We're going to get done early. In closing, what I want you to know, what Christian ever wishes to be known, to become unfair, un, I'm sorry, to become barren or unfruitful? It is not an aspiration of every branch in the true vine to bring forth much fruit. In chapter 3, it says we must know our sanctification. We must know our sanctification. Again, the, the cross was not taken lightly. That death hurt God. It should hurt us. Don't take it lightly. If you've been called and you've been saved, take it for what it is. Your sanctification set you apart unto God from sin. And if you are to know your sanctification is real, and the attacks of these false teachers can be thwarted, but if you don't know scripture and if you don't know and are not experiencing a continued, a continued state of sanctification, you're not going to be sure of your sanctification and become a ready victim. And we all know who's lurking in the dark just waiting for a victim. When you think about, there are some very prominent people that were prominent preachers and prominent in the word of God. We sing a song um, I can't think of the guy's name, the all is well with my soul. This man wrote that song. He was so sure of his salvation and his sanctification. He wrote that song after his kids had gone down in a ship. And yet he, years later, wandered into a cult and, and, was, and wandered away from God because he didn't stay in it. There was probably some mental health issues. But again, there's, there's Satan just waiting with a snare to catch somebody that's prominent in the word of Christ so that he can say, look, he's not real. He, he's hunting for those that are, that are strong in Christ, but he's lurking, looking for those who might be weak, to see you stumble, to see you trip. I never want to be the person that causes somebody to stumble or trip. I don't want Satan using me for anything. We need to take the time each day to spend time with God's word and to make an effort to get to church each week. Tam and I love this church. We love this family. When I was away at my dad's funeral, I couldn't wait to get back. I can't wait till this COVID goes away so we can see the, the precious souls that should be here, Miss Ellen and, and James, James, everybody. And to know that you have family here that love you and will pray for you and, and they don't, we're not judging each other. Gosh knows I don't always sing right. <laughs> you guys keep listening. It's important, and it's what keeps us anchored. It's what keeps us part of God's word and God's, God's work in our life. When I see the people that come here on these food donations, when we've got 60-some cars coming through, people that need food, they need dog food, they need food for themselves, that's a wonderful thing that we're able to supply that for them. You know, and hopefully some of those people will see the love and grace that comes on. My employee that comes out here is not a believer. He's not a non-believer. 
but he is amazed at how nice everybody is here. And he said it's, it's when he comes here, he looks forward to coming here to distribute food because he says it's the kindest people he works with. And we work in a horrible environment of liberalism. So we need, again, to take the time to spend time each day in God's word. We need to attend the Bible studies, the Sunday school. We need to sit quietly with God. We need to sing praise to him. I know somebody every day that will just make up a song and sing praise to God. We need to work every day on being a little bit better, a little bit kinder, a little bit more patient, a little bit more humble. I suffer from a, from a need to be prideful quite often, and I, I've told Chris this, you know, it's probably one of my biggest downfalls is pride. I take pride in my work, knowing my work. The fact that I had to study all since Wednesday night to get this put together. I can talk a lot on a lot of things. People know I can talk. But I should be able to talk just as freely about this as I do my work. In fact, more freely about this. And I can talk about my work all day long. But I can also talk to Christ, talk about Christ. And the more we know this, the more you're going to feel comfortable talking about it. When your friends are suffering through the loss of their wife or the loss of something, loss of a job, and you can refer them to something in the Bible that will lift them up because you know the Bible, that's helpful. It's not only helpful to your friend, but it's helpful to you knowing they're struggling. When they say, oh, that's just what I needed to hear, it's not because I knew it, it's because I knew God's word and I knew where to look for it and I prayed about it and maybe I was led there by God. Look at others through the eyes of the God, our God, who created them. Build your faith so that you can resist the temptations and the false teachers with vigor and that all that you do would honor God. Can you imagine if everybody around us looked at everybody through the eyes of God? All of us made perfect for his plan, whatever that may be. This grace was given to you, and it was given to you freely. Thank God for that grace by emulating him daily, that he would know you love him by your actions. As it says in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18, this is the close of 2 Peter, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. I don't know what more we could ask as Pat and Peggy come up. I suggest as you go through the Bible, read Second Peter. It's only three chapters long. Set a point every week to read something in the Bible. If it's not Second Peter, if it's not Judas, if it's not James, read something every week. As I was talking to my sister and my brother-in-law, they read, they read Old Testament, a Psalm, and New Testament chapter every day. That's how they read through the Bible. The book of Proverbs, if you have children, even me having all my children, almost all adults now, lots of knowledge and wisdom in there. If you answered every time you got angry the way God asked you to answer, our children would be well off, they'd be well behaved, and we would be wonderful parents, never lacking and never regretting anything. So in, as we close, make no promises to me or make no promises to any man, but do what you can to honor God in all that you do. If you get angry, Remember, you need to honor God. If you start judging somebody, does it honor God? For men, if you're in the store and you're looking a second or third time at her, does that honor God? If it's not your wife, think about what you're doing in your work and in, your, in all that you do. Try to do everything you can to honor God. At this time, we're going to close out and there's an invitation. If you have a need to join the church, if you'd like to ask questions about joining the church, if you